fun time. Dr. Chase? Present. Mr. Cater? Here. Ms. Egan? Here. Ms. Hazard? Here. Ms. Healy? Here. Mr. McCosker? Here. Ms. Young? Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you. Would you please stand for the Color Guard presentation and Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'd like to thank North Stafford High School's JROTC for the Air Force for being with us tonight. The cadets uh, color guard was cadets Trujillo, Hilio, Rigdon, Dutton, Cruz, Ruiz, Sawari, Gavino, and Dingtula. And the instructors of the North Stafford Air Force JROTC are Colonel Catherine Bacon and Master Sergeant Juan Mendoza. Do we have a motion for approval of the agenda? Move that we approve the agenda. Second. We motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. That brings us to citizen comments. Dr. Chase? Sure. Uh, individuals wishing to comment at this time may do so by responding to the general invitation by the chairwoman. Speakers shall identify themselves by name, address, and organizational affiliation if the spokesperson represents an organization. Speakers shall also announce the purpose, topic of their comments. Three minutes shall be allotted to speakers. The chairwoman reserves the right to restrict the total citizen comment received at any particular meeting to a predetermined maximum number of minutes with the approval of the board. Citizen comment which is profane, abusive, or which threatens imminent physical harm shall be ruled out of order by the chairwoman. Although the board provides the opportunity for citizen comment, individuals desiring to register complaints against division employees or division programs, services, or activities may also utilize the procedures outlined in Stafford County Public School Policy 1113, public complaints. Thank you, Dr. Chase. We have eight speakers who signed up. I'm going to call uh, four names at a time, and if you come up to uh, the podium and give us your name and your address, please. After those eight have spoken, if anyone else wishes to address the board, you can come forward. The first speaker is Rachel Miller. The second is Perry Como. The third is Jesse Mills. And the fourth is Emily Pease. Hello. Do you want me to say my whole address? Like you want to hear my help, my street name, my everything? Sure. Okay. Rachel Miller, 408 Apricot Street, Embry Mill. Good evening. Redistricting is never fun and easy, but it's necessary at this point. With the rush to get it done, it's in time for the next school year. Mistakes are being made. As one person, I haven't had time to delve into the entire county to find logical tweaks, but I'm almost certain I found some in the, within the Garrisonville district and within the Winding Creek changes. I live in Embry Mill Phase 1, and if one of the two current plans in play go through, my children will bus to the fifth closest elementary school in proximity to go to Park Ridge Elementary. Then they'll go on to H.H. Pool Middle School, but then leave all their friends behind to go to Colonial Forge. As opposed to Autumn Ridge, whose children are going to be going to Winding Creek, leave everybody else to go to H.H. Pool Middle School, and then on to North Stafford High School. That definitely seems backwards to me, especially when we would have to drive through their community to get to Park Ridge. ARC was hired to level out capacity with continuity and proximity in mind. 
but continuity should include the roads were driven, not just a skinny piece of land. Yes, Embry Mill Phase 1 has more elementary students than Autumn Ridge. This is actually perfect because in five years, we are almost back at overcapacity at Park Ridge Elementary School. I can imagine the year after, it's going to be overcrowded, another redistricting situation. But there are other two communities that could benefit from not staying in Winding Creek in these two current plans. In fact, one area has them being moved to Winding Creek from Anthony Burns. They're moving from one from their current school to Winding Creek, which is further from them and already at overcapacity. Why are we moving kids into Winding Creek when we're trying to move them out? Uh, these students are about over 100 of them, so that's 10, over 10% 10 of Winding Creek's capacity. <coughs> also, why is a top-rated school, Margaret Brent Elementary, opening up next year at, at under 70% capacity and has little growth over the next five years? I honestly wish I lived closer to Brent. Augustine North is smack in the middle and can easily free up space at Winding Creek. According to the county projections and numbers, if these changes went through um, that I'm recommending, Winding Creek would start off about 92 kids less next year. And then in the year 2022-2023, they would have about 120 kids less. So this will be for more growth for what's still being built in that area, some neighborhoods like Liberty Knolls and such and at Colonial Forge. Um, I also want to point out that these suggestions don't even change the approximate number of children being redistricted. So these simple changes to the two current plans would not only keep all schools under capacity, but leave room for growth at Winding Creek and Park Ridge so we aren't in the same position in five to eight years. Embry Mill Phase 1 is done being built and we're not projected to grow much. I actually would argue the opposite, that we might not, that we might, our numbers might lower because we had a lot of young families that moved in to there and their kids are going to be growing up, like mine and the majority of the neighbors I feel are that in that situation. These simple changes to the two current plans would also help feeder patterns in such a simple way. It would help you guys to not have to do it later. Um, and also, it's going to help attendance zones and uh, help proximity and continuity. Thank you. You're welcome to, <laughs> to give your comments to the clerk. Thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm Perry Como, also uh, Amber Mills Phase 1. I was, could have given her some of my time, actually. Uh, as uh, Rachel mentioned, I know we've discussed it a little bit and being part of the community as well as coming in from, uh, from Stafford, from Settlers Landing, I know that Embry Mill is growing. Uh, bottom line, I know pretty much every four years, every five years, you know, you start considering new school district and things like that. Because when Embry Mill started building, when I say Embry Mill's, Embry Mill's phase one, because I was over in Settlers Landing at the time, uh, I know once we completed, I know once our kids came over because it was a, a community development. So as Rachel mentioned, there are a lot of younger kids there and turn in four or five years, they'll be moving on to middle school and of course, high school and so on. Uh, my suggestion is pretty simple. Uh, coming from the field, uh, retired military, been around and understanding and continuity and proximity, uh, Winding Creek works for my girls. I got one that's in route, one that's currently there. We had some uh, things that she was faced with when we were at Settlers Land, and she settled in at Winding Creek since we moved, and everything kind of works out fine. What I am suggesting, again, because we know that there is other portions of Ember Mills that are being built, like Phase 2 and eventually a Phase 3, uh, they will double our sizes. We are already done. We've been done for at least a year now. And we know that just as our kids came in together, they're going to leave together every four years or every five years and, and so on. So what I'm considering, what, what I'm suggesting is that if you have the time, if you could uh, just look over the plans that she provided and uh, take in consideration that as you move forward with this decision. Good evening, I'm uh, Jesse Miller, I'm Ember Mill Phase One, uh, Rachel's my wife. I'm here to let you know that I'm unhappy with the current two redistricting plans. Both have my kids driving to the fifth closest school geographically, which to me makes no sense. <clears throat> and also makes our phase one kids the only ones pulled away from their friends to go to, go to Colonial Forge High School, which once again makes no sense to me. because So um, I was under the assumption that the private company was brought, was brought in to create proximity and continuity for our schools. But if so, why does this plan have my kids being bused four miles away through other attendance zones? <clears throat> why are the feeder patterns so mixed up? Why are we putting Parkridge in position to be over capacity in five plus years? Yeah, some people are saying, yeah, we're building a new school. Well, I, I don't see the plans yet. And Aquia Harbor is supposed to have a new 
community uh, new uh, shopping center too. So like all these plans are supposed to happen, but they're not happening. This will create another open capacity situation. It's frustrating that Garrisonville district is being overlooked. I'm in agreement with the rest of my neighbors and support the small tweaks that my wife has presented. I see these tweaks benefit, benefiting all the APUs in, involved. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Emily Pease. I'm phase one as well. Um, I'm a mom of six and I'm supporting my fellow neighbors who are not here tonight. There's many who did not have babysitters. And we just wanted to say that we are so, um, supporting separating the phases due to overcrowding. Um, phase two will be very large and phase three even bigger. And it will create a large amount of separation just in the general part. Um, we are suggesting very small tweaks, which Rachel has outlined. They address proximity, c continuity, capacity, and feeder patterns, which help the county in a whole as well. Plus, I have a rising kindergarten who is very worried that she's not going to know anyone because everyone that she's currently with will separate at one point when we redistrict again when she's not even probably in fifth grade. I also have a fourth grader who is very much worried that he's going to be switching and not knowing which middle school he'll be going to and not the same as his brother. These are things that I think as a whole our plan has outlined and fixed which would greatly appreciate to phase one. Thank you. The other four people who have signed up are Gayla Clatterback, Kelly Thompson, Paul Waldowski, and Jennifer Hensley. Hi, um, my name is Gayla Clatterback, and I live in Phase One as well, Vembry Mill. Um, a big group of us have come together and sent you guys lots of emails about the tweaks, so I'm sure you guys know what we're talking about at this point. Um, I'm here to support that Embry Mill Phase 1 be separated from Phase 2 and Future 3, because unfortunately as a whole neighborhood, we are just too large to send to any elementary school at this point, and we will be larger. Um, the tweaks that we made to the current plans that are on the table, I feel will alleviate future crowding at, Wind at Winding Creek Elementary School and Park Ridge while moving the same amount of children. Rachel gave you guys a long list of what we believe will work for us and will work for the whole county as a whole. Um, moving us to Park Ridge will create overcrowding over 98% in year 2023 and 2024. So we really hope that you guys take these tweaks into consideration. Hope that'll help everybody out. Thank you. Good evening. How are you guys? Good. Um, so I'm Kelly Thompson. I live at 114 Windy Street in Stafford, Virginia. And I'm here more, um, not really to speak on redistricting. Um, that's a whole different topic. Um, I've been through it when I went here. So I'm a staffer girl, went to, element, to middle school here. We were redistricted. So I understand it was hard. We had two high schools, North Stafford High and South Stafford. So it was a little less stressful. Um, but I'm more here to speak on the side, on a teacher and as a parent. So I've been teaching for 18 years at Stafford Elementary School. My heart, my passion, I went to school there. So I'm very dedicated to our community. Um, when I started in 2001, we had paid medi medi um, medical insurance. That was a bonus to join in Stafford County. And then slowly through the years, we froze. Our steps got frozen. And then they would kind of come out of it, but we got no cost of living. And then we got no, you know, no raises on top of it. Well, then we started paying medical insurance. Then we started paying towards our retirement. So that's kind of been a snowball effect. And then on my own personal and more on what I'm here to speak about is mental awareness in our county. And you know, where is our focus on mental awareness and the rise of it, the disabilities, the training for teachers? Um, it's on, it's on a high, it's on a raise. Uh, my son's one of them, and he's trickling through the system, barely. Um, all Stafford schools, he's at the Stafford Day School this year. Um, huge IEP meeting last night, so had lots of support, lots of um, ideas to go, but I feel like they just steadily kind of fall through the cracks. IEPs are not always in compliance. Um, follow through is not properly done in those areas. I'm an inclusion teacher at Stafford L. I do it every day. My day today, I woke up at six, barely got to my son to school, got to work at nine. Coworkers covered me because I couldn't get attendance to help even though we have an attendance plan. I was told there's over 100 students in truancy and that's not how the plan works. Um, if I left him at home, 
I may not have come home to my child. He may have been taken to the hospital or Snowden, or he might have chosen to go to school. So that was kind of hard not getting that support. So I've been doing research, mental awareness. There's lots of training. Dr. Beck, uh, David Jack, superintendent of Falkier, is offering through his county youth mental health first aid. He has a seminar coming up. Um, March 27th, it's from 12 to 1, my planning. So I'm going to take it, watch it, um, educate off of it. It's, he's training his staff on com combating the stigma of youth um, awareness. And the teachers are trained, and then they can wear, they wear purple lanyards knowing that that person has been trained and they may be able to help. It's a lack overall, I think, in education right now that we're not in training on all the, the, the high population of kids and the changes, our rigor is higher, the kids are struggling. And we see it, elementary school, our behavior is awful and it's sad, day to day sad. So, thank you. Mr. Waldowski, I just want to ask the superintendent, Dr. Kisner, could you share that information with us about that training? I think that might be of interest. Thank you, Mr. Waldowski. Paul Waldowski, 8 Pickett Lane, the gerrymandered Rock Hill District. I'm here to represent the 2030 cicadas. Okay, two of you have signed my clipboard. You always make me sign a clipboard. I'm not running for supervisor because of Dylan's rule. You all should look that up. But I am trying to get on the ballot for the Commissioner of the Revenue. Now, this is an election year. I don't know if you're gonna run again, but maybe you can get more than 40% of the vote this time. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> oh. You know, I hear this stuff about town hall meetings. Well, remember, there was a town of Falmouth in 1728. When we do gerrymandering, I keep on proposing to them to bring back the town of Falmouth, and you can have Mayor Bomke, and you can have your elementary schools, and then you can do your own redistricting. I don't want to leave out of choir. Remember, you have your own fire department and police force. You should be a town also. But remember, this is Stafford County. And when you get on the web and you put in school board in Stafford, Virginia, guess what comes up? Wikipedia, and it says that there's 186,785 students. Wow, geez, the population was only 128,961 in 2010. I would suggest that you get that fixed. I'm not telling you what to do, just sharing information. If you saw today um, the scandal of how the rich get their kids into school, isn't that funny? And they're all trying to get a PhD, remember a public high school diploma, and yet mom and dad are trying to uh, buy their way into all the big schools. Simply amazing. I saw a redistricting is gonna be a uh, public hearing tomorrow in North Stafford. My poker game's on Thursday, so I'm sorry I won't be able to join you then. I have to make an appearance at the HOA, you know, the Houses of Aristocrats, see if they'll sign my petition so we can dissolve the HOA. Remember, any of you as citizens can reach me at whyhavehoas at gmail.com. Don't be bashful. I do thank all the citizens who were Stafford County voters today who did sign my petition. It's just a rule in the Commonwealth where common sense is not common. What can I say? Uh, do I have any more comments here? Oh yeah, final comment. Wasn't it a great color guard? USAF. Wasn't Army, wasn't Navy, wasn't USCG. It was a good one. <coughs> Hensley. Hi, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Hensley and I live at 320 Pear Blossom and I am also here from Embry Mill Phase 1. Um, I have sent a few emails and now I am here to personally express my interest in keeping Phase 1 of Embry Mill at Winding Creek. Um, 
without repeating everything that everyone who lives in Embry Mill has, who has spoken before me has said, I just wanted to express that I also share these opinions and ask that you seriously consider the alternatives that Rachel Miller has provided. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board? Please come forward. Now, the people that have already spoken signed in, so after you speak, we'll ask you to sign that um, right, right there, but after you finish. Thank you. Hi, I'm Matthew Dane. I live in uh, Embry Mill, Phase 1 as well, uh, 280 Parablossom Road. I agree with everything that Rachel and Galit and everybody else said. I wanted to add in the two other points. Um, right now, my daughter goes to school about 8 o'clock in the morning. She goes to Winding Creek. She gets picked up right at 8, 8.05, and she doesn't get home till 4. Right? She gets out of school at 3.10, and it takes almost an hour for her to get home, and it's 1.1 miles. Now we're going to add another mile to that, which is going to take another half hour, which means she's at school from 8 or 8.30 in the morning until 4.30, 4.45 in the afternoon. It's a long day for a 9-year-old. Right? So yes, I can go pick her up, but I work. It's hard to do that. Um, the second point is the children shouldn't have to change schools every two years. Right? This is developmental years. Right, they get a teacher they like, they, they have the environment they like, they have the kids they like, they enjoy that. We should let them stay in the schools that they started in or they grow to be their little homes while they're there for four or five or six years and let them grow and develop and become the children they need to be. Not worried about what school they're going to be in next year, what friends they're going to have, who's going to go from their neighborhood onto the next one. It's just not right to make little children do that. If you want to change middle school or you know, high schools, that's fine. Those kids can handle it a little better. But the nine-year-olds, the eight-year-olds, the seven-year-olds, I mean, it's, it's hard for them to do that. So, I mean, small tweaks, keeping them a mile from their home instead of being two or three miles in a different, you know, school district five, you know, again, we're moving through multiple school districts to a different area. I don't have a problem with Park Ridge. I don't have any problem with any of the schools. It's just the welfare of my children. I'd rather them be closer to home, home earlier, and not have to deal with changing every two years and overcrowding and overpopulation. That's all. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board? The pen work. Oh, here's one. Oh, you got one. All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public comment period and come to the board. Oh, oh, come on down. If it, if there's anyone after this, please stand up so we'll know. All right. Hi, Gabe Beltran. Uh, also, Phase One at Embry Mill, 527 Apricot Street. Um, I was the Miller's neighbor, now I live just down the street from them. Same thing, we moved to Stafford County for the great school district here. Um, my children, my daughter is in fourth grade, moving on to fifth grade. I've got a son in third grade this year, and I've got an upcoming kindergarten also. All of them have been at Winding Creek, have really enjoyed their time at Winding Creek. Um, like Matt said, I don't think there's a bad school in Stafford County. I think that proximity, I think that transportation, I think that capacity, a lot of these things, obviously you guys are trying to do your best job, right? But I think Rachel's pointed out some small tweaks that could still keep your goals in place, right? Uh, but would keep the children where their parents would like to see them, where the phase one, which is a little bit more established and subtle, would like to see them. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. He, he actually put my name on there. Oh, how nice. All right, and no one else wants to address the board? We'll close the public hearing. Public, not the public hearing, that's tomorrow night, the public comment period. And uh, you all are welcome to come back tomorrow night at North Stafford, 630. We'll have a, a public hearing for <coughs> anyone who wants to come speak specifically about the uh, redistricting. And Thursday night at Stafford High School, uh, same time, 630. Um, we are here for board member comments. Ms. Egan, would you like to start us? I going to defer. Okay, thank you. Mr. McOsker. Defer. Dr. Chase. I have comments. Uh, so I just wanted to share that uh, Dr. Kisner extended the offer to the school board members to attend a conference called Creating Cultures of Equity and Excellence for All, and it was a two-day conference last week, and I appreciate the opportunity to attend, which I did. Um, and it brought home the value of strong professional development for teachers, staff, and administrators. Um, it was a reminder that we as a board can help all Stafford children get an excellent education by adopting policies that support all children. Um, and I had the opportunity to brainstorm with counselors from other counties 
about how we might address the racial disparity that exists in Stafford County with respect to disciplining black children. Black children make up about 10% of our student population, but for some reason over half of our suspensions and expulsions are given to black students. And this is the case even at the elementary school level. So I hope we can find ways to work with students before we reach the point of suspension or expulsion. Um, tomorrow night's public hearing, I want to apologize in advance for missing it. I have been tasked with presenting the school board's requested budget to the Board of Supervisors next week. Um, I know that many parents are very concerned about which school their child will be attending next year, but I think an ev of even greater importance is having the funds required to staff all our schools with the best people available. So uh, I need time to prepare that presentation, and I hope you all will think about putting as much effort into um, advocating for that as, as which school your child goes to. Um, and finally, uh, a number of people have asked me why I stopped fighting to keep students from Old Forge at Rocky Run. Well, I contacted every single board member in advance of last Thursday's work session. Um, the support wasn't there. Uh, I could have kept trying, but these students are slated to come to Conway Elementary, which is one of my schools. Uh, to continue fighting might give the impression that Falmouth's school board member doesn't want these students in her district. Nothing could be further from the truth. I want every student who attends a school in my district to know that they are welcomed and I will advocate to meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chase. Ms. Young. Sure. <clears throat> Good evening. Um, yeah, like um, Sarah said last week, um, Dr. Chase, Dr. Kisner, and other staff also, we attended a two-day conference of creating cultures of equity and excellence for all by transforming our organizational culture. In order to do that, uh, we need to look at our policies, for example, our discipline and referral policies, and we did not talk about <laughs> Uh, talking about the same thing just happened um, look at how we are asking teachers to create an environment they have never experienced and look at our own implicit biases we bring into our work environment um, this is not going to happen overnight we need to invest in change change does not come easy and um, it's something that everyone needs to embrace um, with that said um, we need to think about what values we want to communicate through our environment. How do we want our children to experience their time in our classrooms? What do the artifacts of the walls communicate to the students and parents? What do we want the environment to teach those who are in it? We need to have a school with patience, caring, trusting, honesty, forgiving, and selflessness. So I want to concentrate on discipline and referrals, mental training also, if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Ms. Decatur. Hi, everybody. So it's been a little bit stressful on the board, as I think uh, we've noted. Um, <clears throat> We've been incredibly busy trying to come up with a plan that will be that will work for for everyone. And uh, Embry Mill, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I I really didn't want to admit, but I trick or treat in your guys's neighborhood. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, we were invited by residents. So so don't <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> No, uh, you know. So I'll just say we're we're working really hard. I want everyone to understand that. Um, as you know, we're getting emails as board members from many of our constituents with, with many tweaks, and some of them are even from direct neighbors in conflict with the others. So, you know, it really is a, a very difficult job to try to please everyone and make sure that everyone's needs are being met. But as a board, I have full faith that we're going to come together and work together and come up with a plan that is going to be in the best interest of every single student in this county. Um, you know, I've, I've got boys too, and, and, and we've all got children. We don't want to see our kids just frivolously moved around, and, and that's the last thing any of us want to do to any kid in this county. And I would just like to stress that something I was thinking about this week um, that I would just like to stay, say for the record is I represent children who live within 
little sections called APUs that are in my district. While I have schools that are also located within that boundary line, those are not my schools per se. Those are the county schools and they are open to any children in this county if it makes sense for them to come there um, as far as the location is concerned. So, you know, when we're talking about moving kids in and out of, of my schools, the, these are the, the children's schools. Um, it, they're just our APUs that we represent. And I just hope that that's very clear because um, that's all. Thank you. Ms. Hazard. Sure. Again, thank you all for coming tonight and for anybody who gets involved in, in the school process. And it's not just, you know, the emails we receive. It's also those who are involved every day in the schools, who volunteer, who send in food, who do all the wonderful things that we do. Um, that's the great thing about our community is I think we pitch in, we jump in when there's an issue or when we know there's a need. And part of that, um, I mean, this is hard. This is very hard. I have sat through, well, not as many as a, I think two board members, but at least <laughs> a lot. <laughs> and um, the one thing about our community is I know we, we jump in, and I hope that we continue to support our schools um, no matter where we are. And that's not directed at anybody who's here. It's meant in general because we have a lot of needs. But we also want to think about the broader school system. We, we believe me, I can name all the mascots for my kids' schools. I will always know them, and I have my sweatshirts. But it's also how do we, even as we maybe leave the school system as parents, which for me is looming, how do I con continue to contribute? I know that Dr. Kisner is actually going to touch on something we actually talked um, about our community partners, but it doesn't just have to be our businesses who remain a part of our schools. Go and read, go and do things even after your kids leave. So just, you know, staying involved in our schools. That leads me to our school board advisory committees. Um, had a wonderful um, discussion last night with our fine arts people and really some great ideas. Get involved um, in, those, in those communities. I know many of us have enjoyed reading in our schools uh, this month. I have to say when we have things like redistricting, getting back in the schools and reading to our kids is a great reminder of why we do what we do, um, you know, is seeing those. Um, I'm looking forward to our Head Start dinner, which we will have, I mean, I will see you all many times before <laughs> our next meeting, but I'm excited as we look to that. Um, I think something we as a board, and I will be asking probably Dr. Kisner about this, is our double bus runs. I know that it's been mentioned maybe tonight. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I know my sort of the schools that I represent, I know a little bit more about their double bus runs, but I do think that's something we really do need to look at as a county. I'm hopeful that as we move through this redistricting process, we are making and limiting that we are trying to get kids closer to where they are to limit that. But I do think we as a, as a board and a, as a um, division really need to look at these double bus runs. I know today that a, a bus was leaving one of the schools today at 10 of five. And that's gonna be a really long day for a, for a student. And so I just think, and that is not meant, it, it, I know we need bus drivers so I, I know you all will continue to hear me that that is something I really think we have to look at. But I do think we hear us on the bu double bus runs and trying to put together a plan, which I know we had, but of course then we may change all the routes. How do we really address this double bus run issue and get in our kids home so late? Oh, you got that bus number, Dr. Kisner? No. Oh, well, you're assuming I have no comments. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll be very brief. I want to, um, so to piggyback on Ms. Decatur's comments about our schools. Um, many, many years ago, um, I, I think about 18 in, uh, to be exact, um, I used to talk about my schools being the schools in the Rock Hill District, and I was very um, 
gently, uh, or maybe not so gently, uh, reminded by our superintendent, who has been gone for a long, long time, that they're all our schools. Every school in Stafford County belongs to the school board. I mean, we may have certain responsibilities within our district, but every school is ours. We're responsible for every child. And I, I, I think that's something that we're probably more cognizant of now than when we're not dealing with you know, a tense topic like the redistricting. And I can also say that 18 years ago, um, my daughter who was in the second grade got redistricted, ironically, out of Park Ridge, because at that time, Park Ridge had 1,050 students, and they were designed for, I think, 950. So it, it, it is cyclical, but we have, you know, we have more schools now than we, than we did at the time. Um, but I just want to make sure everybody understands that we are listening, we are reading. Um, I don't respond to all the emails because there is not enough time in the day to respond, but I am reading every one of them. I know my colleagues are reading every one of them. Um, the ones that are addressed to us personally, we are sharing with our clerk to share with every member of the board um, so that everyone sees everything that is sent. It's being sent to the superintendent uh, and, and to the consultant. Um, the, the one thing that is absolutely clear is that we cannot make everybody happy. The only way we could do that if we could wave a magic wand and make our schools you know, have higher capacity so nobody would have to move. You know, the, the good news is nobody wants to leave. Not one person has come to us from any school and said, please move me, I want to go somewhere else. They all want to stay. I mean, that's so, so I think that's a tribute to our teachers and our administrators and our staff at the schools. So enough said about that. Um, public service announcement tomorrow, 6.30, North Stafford High School. A Thursday night, 6.30 at Stafford High School will be the public hearings. Um, everybody will have you know, up to three minutes, and there will not be a time limit on that. I mean, we hope to, to not be there till the next day, but um, whatever it takes, we will, you know, we will be there to, to listen and to hear. And I, I know Dr. Chase is gonna be working on, on the budget presentation. Besides being our vice chairman, she's also the chairman of our, um, our FAB, that is the Finance and Budget Committee. So she's, I know, going to do an excellent job next week, and, and she'll catch us on the rerun because it'll all be taped. Um, so I encourage you to, you know, have your voices heard. Um, and we are hearing not just where people want to go or where they want to stay, but some of the issues that are being raised. And, and this is a good time to make them known so that the superintendent uh, can be working with his staff to address those issues before we begin a new school year. Not just for, for those of you here, but you know, for, for all our students. Dr. Kisner, your turn. Thank you. <laughs> when I got home after the last school board meeting, I had an email from someone saying, could you please speak closer to the mic? So today they chose to come to the meeting, so that's better. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to follow up on the redistricting. Um, we are already starting uh, the elementary principals and, and Ms. Neely, the planning. Um, we've had some preliminary discussions. On March 20th, I'll be meeting with all 17 um, principals, along with transportation, technology, HR, um, uh, buildings and grounds to start talking about some of the questions that we need to start be thinking about to make sure this is a smooth transition for um, the children, the families, and the staff that will be uh, impacted. So I just want to let you know that work has already um, started. There's a couple of other quick things. Um, uh, Ms. Egan sent an email to all of us, and I just want to, I don't, don't want her to think that um, it's being dismissed. Um, we're already starting the work on our middle school instruction. Um, we, um, as you know, the last couple board meetings I have shared with you, we have presented some data. Last board meeting, I actually gave you a handout of our three-year trend. But I want to let you know that we have scheduled a series of, um, of, uh, of professional development 
for our middle school staff. The first one is uh, March 25th. We have one April 24th and then June 19th and 20th where we're going to be focusing on our response to intervention, instructional pedagogy, and as um, other people have articulated, making sure that we're using the best equity and differential policies to make sure our, all of our students um, are getting a very strong education. So that work is in place. In April or May, um, Rebecca Towery has been tasked to um, do a more formal presentation to the school board on our middle school model, give you some history, and tell you where we're moving forward. So I just want to make sure she has the right time. Um, so it'll be April or May. So I just want to let you know that work is taking place. Some other things very quickly. Um, we had a uh, extremely positive business advisory um, meeting last week. We had um, over 20 businesses came to North Stafford High School. Um, uh, students led, uh, first of all, they ate in the cafeteria. So they had cafeteria food, they, they, they enjoyed it. At least they didn't complain, they, <laughs> no one got a write up. Um, but they visited our critical education programs. Um, students led the tours. Uh, the teachers were great, the students were great. And then we, we got back to the library and I really feel like there was great enthusiasm and a commitment that they want to bring other business uh, members of our business community to be part of our, um, our, our journey towards excellence. And the next uh, visit will be at Stafford High School where we'll do something similar again to see our career technical education program. So I do want to thank Cherie and, and others um, to help put that um, together. And then I do want to mention at, when we went in front of the Board of Supervisors for um, the Ferry Farm uh, project, uh, we had a discussion about uh, air quality. And one question that was asked was, when was the last time we did an air quality sampling? And it w has been a while. So we went ahead and on March 8th, we did it again. We, we got an update. There was one area, it was a minor area, but we're doing further testing. There was a boys' bathroom in a downstairs level that showed some traces of mold. So we want to make sure that test was accurate. And if it was accurate, what work do we need to do to remediate that issue? So I just want to let the board know. And when we get the final um, uh, report, we'll just go ahead and forward it to uh, the entire school board. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kisner. Um, that brings us to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve two items of consent, 701 and 702. Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Hauser, a second? Second. Second by Ms. Egan, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Bring, do you have any announcements, Dr. Kisner? No. Okay. That brings us to action items, 8.01, adoption of a resolution to nominate three local businesses for the 2019 VSBA Business Honor Roll. Those businesses are ABM Industries, Apple Federal Credit Union, and G Cubed Community Services and G Cubed Enterprises. Do we have a motion? Motion to nominate three local businesses for the 2019 VSBA Business Honor Roll. Motion by Ms. Young. Second. Second by Ms. Hazard. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. 8.02, approval of a six-month premium holiday for employee paid health insurance from April 1st through September 1st, 2019. Dr. Chase? Sure. Uh, motion to approve a six-month premium holiday for employee paid health insurance from April 1st through September 1st, 2019. Second. Motion by Dr. Chase, second by Ms. Young. Any discussion? Could I ask that a little, um, we, we went over this last time when it was on for information. If we could just briefly explain again what this is and how long it's going to be in effect and what it means for the employees who are going to be getting this money. So um, we staff, uh, with the help of our insurer, Anthem, sets uh, sort of the price of, of what we charge for premiums and the amount that um, the school division um, puts in um, and uh, since 2014 we have 
had a balance increasing. And so the decision was made to give some of this money back to our employees because employees who are insur have been paying for insurance, um, uh, it's, we could think of it kind of like a refund, but it's, it's sort of uh, the exact terminology is a little tricky because, you know, somebody who just started working here this past fall has not been putting as much in, but we have people who left last year who won't be getting anything out. So <laughs> it's, it's not exactly a refund. Um, so what will happen is people who are currently enrolled in our insurance for the next six months, starting April 1st, will not have to pay their health insurance premium. Um, until September 1st um, and I think as I said last time it's it's very important that um, our finance people are really clear that it is just a six-month holiday and and not to be surprised when their Stop. paycheck goes up for six months and then goes back down okay. and, and this is only for the health insurance it doesn't affect it doesn't, it doesn't affect, affect dental, dental or anything right. Okay. Right. can I make a comment I just wanted to add um, last time during the action, um, Mr. Fulmer, I did mention that the staff needs to be informed often because the one, especially the ones that don't have a uh, computer, I don't know if you plan on putting some kind of paper in their um, paycheck, and also translation for um, non-English speaking employees. And um, Dr. Chase already mentioned it, but just to be informed that this savings health benefit is from those employees that paid in to the premiums. Uh, I know we had emails that stating individuals that, hey, I work and I don't take insurance, so that means that you didn't put anything in. So um, that needs to be understood, right? And that it's only for six months, I think. Okay, thank you. Any, any further questions or discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 8.03, approval of change order number one to VMDO Architects for additional design services for $47,500 for the renovation slash addition Ferry Farms Elementary School project. Mr. Sure, uh, move to approve. What? Second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I just have a question. I, I think I might have left when you guys talked about this um, the last time because I had um, a birthday. <laughs> um, I see that it's not budgeted, um, and I tried to find where this money was coming from um, without it being budgeted. Are we taking it away from something? Um, I'm unclear about that. Yes, ma'am. Um, there were design funds f assigned to the project, and um, our original uh, agreement with VMDO was less than the, uh, the amount allocated for that. Okay. And so, essentially, the funds will be coming out of the project, but out of the design area of the project okay. without impacting the construction. Great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Egan. I think that's important that people know we're Questions. spending money from this, this project. And uh, I know Mr. McOsker is very pleased that this is moving forward. Um, any other questions, comments? All in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 8.04, approval to add the school division to the remainder of the county's 10-year maintenance and system upgrade agreement two with Motorola Solutions and approval of a contract amendment in the amount of $283,000 $610.95 for maintenance of the transportation services radio system. Do we have a motion? Uh, move to approve. Second. Motion, motion by Mr. McOsker, second by Ms. Egan. Questions or discussion? Ms. Young, did you have any? No. Okay. Okay. Any? No questions? All right. Um, all in favor, motion to approve, please say aye. 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 All opposed, motion carries unanimously. Brings us to information items. 9.01, adoption of a resolution to authorize an application to the Virginia Public School Authority for sale bonds in an amount not to exceed 6385000 with the objective of providing net proceeds of 5940000 for the 2019 spring bond pool. Right. This is on for information. Um, the 
uh, superintendent is asking that this uh, be moved to action uh, if the board is willing to do so because the VSBA asked the resolution be returned to them no later than the week of March 11th which is this week, this week. and the we do have in the um, information item here the reason why this could not come to us earlier <coughs> uh, is it states that the uh, Stafford County Public School staff were un unable to bring this agenda item to the board at the February 26th board meeting because they couldn't finalize the information for the spring bond borrow until the projects and amounts were finalized so this is not a matter of staff not uh, being timely it's they acted as soon as they can it's just the window is very short for this borrow and if we're going to be able to get on the um, the list and be able to borrow this money um, the application needs to go in this week and this is essential for having an August start for right this school, this, correct this is um, <laughs> it includes uh, rebuild Moncure Elementary School um, and Rock renovate Hill. North Star early Rock I'm going down the list <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> don't worry I'm not going to leave out Rock Hill one of our schools <laughs> um, renovate North Star early childhood <laughs> learning center I thought it was is that what it is learning center I thought it was yeah. more ed early education it's early, childhood. Er, early, childhood. early childhood education center, yeah. education center. Some, somebody need, hadn't gotten the memo on that yeah so we'll have name. to fix that so and having said that madam chair I'd like to make the motion to All move right, it to action be, okay but I'd like to add it also includes replace mechanical systems Rock Hill Elementary School oh. and additions renovation Ferry Farms Elementary School so full disclosure here um, all those projects are um, are included we have a motion by Ms. Egan to move this um, second to, to action second by Ms. Young any discussion no all in favor of the motion to move it to action please say aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed all right this is now uh, an action item madam chair I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve uh, well 9.01 I guess will change to something else 8.05 8.05 all right adoption of, of resolution to authorize an application for the Virginia Public School Authority VSP VPSA for the sale of bonds and in the amount not to exceed six million three hundred eighty five million with the objective of providing net proceeds of five point nine four zero for the 2019 spring bond pool thank you <laughs> second was a much easier to second <laughs> all right we, I have, do have, we have a a very detailed thank you very much motion Ms. Egan and a second by Dr. Chase any discussion I just have a, a question yes, and it. I am in support of this but I just wanted to confirm it says that um, one of the deferred projects was originally due to be funded with the bond it is my understanding going back and looking at ours that the HH pool interior finishes was from the repair list and the Mountain View High School track was from the bond list is that correct Mr. Haran? Okay, I just wanted to make, when I saw it was only one of the deferred projects, I have to say my recollection from that was that it was two bonded projects, so I just wanted to make sure I understood it, too. Am I correct? I'm sorry. Um, no, you're pretty clear. I just want to be clear. I think they were both bonded, but one of them was for this spring, and HH Pool Interior Finishes was actually, I believe, a fall bar of FY20. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so okay. it wouldn't, it's not quite deferred yet. It'll have to be deferred. Okay, I appreciate it. I, yep. I remember from the, the motion and how we chose it. I just, yeah, just wanted to make sure I knew what we were doing so that we could be. Yeah, clear. technically, so I think I they're am, both I am on supporting the it. I just wanted to understand it. They're both on the repair list, both being bond funded, funded. and both being deferred. Understood. Thank you for clarifying. Okay, any other questions, comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And Dr. Kistner, thank you for providing us that information on why it needs to be moved move forward. All right, that brings us to 9.02, approval of the superintendent's proposed revisions to regulation 4304-R, licensed personnel teacher salary guidelines. Dr. Kistner, do you want to um, address this or have staff address this? Okay, so, yeah, so um, as you know, we're in a very competitive recruiting market and when we try to uh, get experienced teachers especially positions that are hard to staff such as math and special ed and so on um, we limit ourselves truly we limit ourselves from people north of us to consider coming to Stafford because 
our pay scale is already lower than theirs. And then on top of that, if they have more experience, we put them on a lower scale. So they kind of get a double whammy. So we're in region three. So we, uh, evaluate, we uh, surveyed region three and region four. Region four is Prince William going north and then going west to, uh, to Winchester. And what we discovered is what you have in your um, board docs is that uh, the majority of the school systems either have no cap or have no cap, and then others have um, uh, the ability for the uh, HR superintendent to um, offer what they believe a person deserves on the hard to staff positions. The other thing I'll just quickly mention, uh, I know it was a discussion at our work session, it's hard to answer the question how many people were impacted because we didn't employ them, okay? But we did take a look at the last three years of people that we capped at 20, just so you know. Uh, it's 17, and two of them just this year. Out of that 17, I will let you know five already left, um, so it's, it's 12. So next year, I will be in a position to um, let you know how many people and what, if any, budgetary impact occurred. We staff pretty much at year five. When we do our budget, we do it basically at year five. So, um, and as you know, in our salary line item, um, at least the last couple of years, we have um, had a surplus, okay? So we're hiring more people at a younger, um, uh, less um, experience. So I'll kind of stop there unless you have questions. Any questions, Ms. Egan? I, I don't have any questions. I'm, I'm just, I, I, I know we talked about this in, a, in our work session, and I, I still have some concerns that we're setting up a, and I think Ms. Haley and I were both kind of on the same page with this, that we're setting up this, um, this expectation uh, that we may not be able to um, fulfill because of budgetary, and I know you said that you w will be addressing that at some point. Um, I'm just concerned that we're kind of we're doing what we did with the with the step scale, and you know, there's an anticipation now that people are going to be pushed up or their caps are going to be lifted, and and um, I, I'm just concerned about that. I'm, I'm not against this. I just have some I have concerns. That's a good point, Dr. Kisner. Could you address how this affects the current employees? Yes. Yeah, so we're moving forward. What we're recommending is that we just go effective employees that we hire for uh, the 1920 school year. Okay. I, what what we need to be. I mean, the way I look at it, whatever happened in the past occurred, um, and we already heard examples of where things that have occurred in the past. Uh, don't really sound fair, just as you heard tonight. And I guess what I would like to do is not repeat that, that if we hire somebody who came to us with 25 years experience and we're only giving them 20, that they're not standing in front of the board three, four years from now and say, you know, I didn't get the experiences, the, the years of experience. I will just tell you something. I, I have a, somebody very close to me uh, call my wife, um, uh, um, that is looking for, uh, uh, anybody from other school systems listening, um, for a, a position. And I could tell you how competitive it is because even some of those school systems that say they have a cap, they're, they're, not, they're telling her, not, don't worry about it. That, that there is, and she's uh, mainly looking to be a school counselor. And that's good, as we discussed at the last meeting, how that's gonna be a very difficult position to fill because of the new standards of quality and everybody's going to be looking the same year. So I'm not even even sure the data we have. I mean, the data we have that Lisa cl collected is correct, but I'm not sure how much it's really being followed based on what I learned from some of those school systems said they have a cap and she's hearing that. Eh. And it's not because, they, it's not because of me. If anything, they would cap it because of me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, is this something we want to consider to make a pilot program or have it, you know, period of time? I would think one year would, wouldn't be enough, but if we said two years and then have a report come back to see the, um, the impact, because right now I know your belief is it's not going to have a financial impact, but 
it's something if, if there are concerns on the board, I, th I don't think that would be any problem. It, it wouldn't be like we were taking it away once we put it in. Right. Um, and well, it would give us an opportunity, but I, I do think we'd have to do it more than a year to I, be practical. I think, I think that's a good idea, and the reason I think it's a good idea is it forces us to address it again in a couple of years, you know, to see whether it's working or not, kind of like we should be doing with the cell phone yeah. policy, but I digress. <laughs> um, we can put that on a future agenda <laughs> if you'd like. Um, so I'm just one person. If, if the board is agreeable to it, I, I would say, you know, we'll, it'll force us to have this conversation again in two years. Um, if not, that's fine, too. I just think we need to talk about it. Right. And, and, and yeah. I think there's, there's got to be a way to go and look back and maybe, you know, not now, not this year, but the teachers that we hired that did have the cap, um, you know, how do, how do we make them whole? I mean, it, we're, we're, we're giving an advantage to somebody that's coming in the door and really not taking care of the people that came in, notwithstanding the, the cap. So it's not, I'm not asking for an answer now, but I, I think it's something that we need to look at, see how many are potentially affected. Um, I, I think there's areas, and I appreciate those comments, I think there's areas that we need to begin to look at where were there some inequities, where were some decisions that were probably necessary at that time, but maybe 2019, 2020, 2021, we could look at adjusting. And, and I could think of others from conversations. I will be bringing to you another one, just so you know. I've talked about it at one of our meetings, the hybrid VRS. We absolutely, um, again, I, I'm sure there was a reason. So we look at Spotsylvania and Prince William as our two main competitors. Both of them have no <coughs> caps on sick, one has 240 days. Let's just, Spotsylvania has 240 sick days that a hybrid, anybody hired after 2012 is in a hybrid VRS. Prince William has no cap. We have a 24 day cap, sick days. Why? The, 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 mark, the, the recruiting environment right now is extremely competitive. So you are looking at our school system and you come with 16, 18, 19 sick days. You're learning that you may only get to carry, may only get to add five more, okay? So there, these are the things that, I'm, that I will be bringing to you um, just because um, it's, in a sense, it's a review. A couple of years ago when you, now we do have a policy, I don't know how often we, I think we follow it. I shouldn't say that, that we're not following it. Every First five we years, every, every five years we're supposed to review our policies. Okay, so in a sense we have a built-in structure to review our policies, um, which I think is what you need to do. I think we all need to. I do have a question for the two lawyers here, or any lawyer, anybody listening. When it's, when a school board policy says, because I was a little uh, interested in this one, I'm with policies and regulations. The policy on this one says the superintendent shall uh, promulgate, am I saying the word right? Promulgate. Promulgate. Um, what's, do you have it for, it's, it's basically a one sentence thing. We all know what shall is, right? Yeah. That's right. So, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so it you states well. that, Must. If you read the policy, it gives the impression from the few lawyers I know that, yeah, you can make this decision. And then we have a regulation says what you have in front of you. So I think it's a future conversation. Our policies and regulations based on your policy is not aligned in many areas. You have your definition of school board policies and your definition of regulations is not a practice that we're constantly following. So I think the review, I would, but this was a very simple, if you go to this policy, if somebody wants to look at it real quickly, if you'd like to research. <laughs> but no, if, it'll, it'll come back to us another. Yeah, but it's yeah. a one sentence thing which would give the impression that, and I say this respectfully, not that I would hide anything from you, but we did spend a lot of time researching this, talking to people, and I just wonder if that was time wise spent where based on your policy, 
it sounds like the superintendent could make a decision on the initial placement of new staff based on your policy, okay? And, and again, I'm deferring to my two board members that are attorneys to see if I'm interpreting that different. Now, not to put Daryl in a bad suit, I asked him that. You know, I learned having a br brother, sister, uh, daughter, and lawyers that you should ask a question that you know the answer. And Daryl- ask a question you don't know <laughs> yeah. the answer. And Daryl did suggest, I don't want to put it on the spot, that you have this authority except there's a regulation that take that authority away from you. So, uh, so I don't know why regulations constantly come in front, uh, front of the board. That, that's my whole point. Yeah, that's good, Madam yeah. Chair. So that well, well, as we may recall from our training from another mm -hmm. lawyer, reasonable minds may differ yeah. on different interpretations, but I, th I think that's certainly something that can, can come back to the board. Yeah. But since we have a specific regulation right, no. i would not think we would want to have a violation of that and that's why i have it in front of you i'm not i'm just <laughs> i'm just curious on how those things yeah are. just just if i may they um so you know the, the concern the concern with some board members and i'm sure all the board members is when we in, institute a um, hu human capital decision uh that we, we don't want to see a huge bill or else if we do see a huge bill we want to see it coming right so we don't inundate the system during budget time or even next budget with millions of dollars of Oh my gosh, you didn't know that 85 people are going to retire on this? However, comma, we have issues with getting qualified teachers, especially our math and our English, and that's, that is a fact. And that is a fact across the Commonwealth, and I would say across the United States. That, and so the HR team has to come up with the human capital decision, and the superintendent needs to make the call on this kind of stuff. And this is, this is, my, this is my opinion. Uh, at a moment's notice, if, if the guy or gal, if, we, if we're hiring them, it, even in our own policies, it says if you're a military vet and, and you have this, this, and this experience, you'll come in at this step. You'll come, at, you'll come in with these years' experience. That's an HR call uh, with, with a superintendent that we hired. So um, make the right call. Any other? So I, I see that the superintendent is asking us to move this to action because there's a teacher job fair coming up on Saturday yes. the 23rd. Yes. Um, and so he would like to be able to um, be more effective in his recruiting. More competitive. Yes. All right, so is there a motion to move this to action? Motion to move it to action. Okay. Motion second. To action. Motion by Ms. Young, second by Mr. McOsker. Any discussion? I, I would I would like to have a report come back on an annual basis of the you know the the uh, impact at, at least for a few years because I think it would be helpful to show um, what the you know what the cost is but also the impact on recruiting because hopefully this will help us um, attract some of those teachers that are going to our neighboring jurisdictions and we we need them and I certainly you know as you said uh, math and English but there's other a lot of other areas that um, that we're having a hard time um, you know, attracting people. Latin. So. Well, shall, shall do. <laughs> really? Great response. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion? Was that to move it to action? That was action. to move it to action. action. All right. All in favor, of moving to action. Please say aye. 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 All opposed. All right. Now it's uh, what is it? Eight point oh six. 8.06, do we have a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. McOsker, second by Ms. Young. Any may, discussion? May Ms. I? Young. Oh, Ms. Young, Ms. 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 Hazard. <laughs> sorry, Ms. Hazard. Um, and I would just ask if the uh, motion makers would add what Ms. Healy said, um, adding an annual review of this, um, of the impact and the, not, and I don't mean just the budget impact of our successes from, I mean, you know, sure. in terms of how it impacted. Uh, so some an annual review and make it as part of the motion. Yeah, I don't know what the past practice has been, but we should do an annual presentation of our hiring. Right. I mean, you should get a breakdown sometimes, say, late September, October, usually after, you know, things have settled. <laughs> so, you know, we hired X amount of teachers with this year's experience mm -hmm. and these degrees. So, yeah, that will be included into this. 
It's up to the motion maker. I just uh, think. Mo uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to um, amend. I'd like to move to approve uh, with uh, Ms. Hazard's uh, language. Second. What, what about a uh, looking at the impact on the current uh, employees? I mean, well, it doesn't have to be part of the, the motion, but if the board is interested in that, we could certainly ask Dr. Kisner to yeah. take a look. Now, I know the next month or two months or perhaps even Higher. three months are going to be busy, busy with getting ready for you know, the early opening. But, you know, <coughs> at some point, perhaps next fall, that could, next fall. That could come back. Because yeah, I, I mean, I think I think that I think that a, a well-rounded uh, evaluation would include something like that. I mean, I I think that. Well, perhaps, but if we're just looking at the impact, that would be from this point forward right. for the evaluation. I'm I'm talking about looking back at the, the people. I think you said there were 17. 12. 17 in the last three years. That's the data we feel confident, and five of those. Uh, uh, since, since left us. Okay. Um, so that's not. Yeah. You know, but they get, yeah, and then two the this okay. current school year okay. have um, been f frozen at step <coughs> three, but they would have been on a higher scale if we had higher step if we had a, a scale. Okay. Well, perhaps that could come back to us as well. Yeah. It's not part of the motion, but yeah. something to look at. All right. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye, motion passes unanimously. That brings us to information item 9.03, award of a furniture delivery order to Interiors by Guernsey of Chantilly, Virginia, for $110,000 using Virginia Public School Authority funds for the purchase of classroom, office, and cafeteria furniture in support of the Renovate North Star Early Education Center project this is an information item and this will be coming back for action at the next meeting any questions anybody want to get some information before it comes back yeah so I'm just curious um, I see that it says uh, the budget is 400,000 for furniture and what's being asked for is 110,000 is that all the furniture will there be more furniture that needs to be purchased or is this coming in under budget I hope it comes in under budget, but uh, no, uh, there's additional furniture, especially some of the backfill for some of the, the classrooms at the elementary school that we are vacating, and also uh, equipment, some of the IT equipment, switches, cameras, uh, some of the um, monitors that we're putting into the classroom, all those fall under that $400,000. So they'll be coming if it, ex you know, depending on the threshold, but yes, there'll be more furniture coming to the board for approval. Thank you for that question, Dr. Chase. Um, any other questions? Yeah, you already left. Um, Mr. Horan, I wanted to know if the um, this furniture would also cover um, those 10 new rooms that were going to be um, worked on for the award um, project for Ms. Massey. The so, award? Yeah, so Ms. Massey has that project that she's waiting to see that award um, two rooms, yeah, just just two rooms. Okay. Will it cover? This is part of that to cover that or no? You know, to be honest with you, ma'am, I'm not familiar with what Miss um, Matheny is doing. Um, okay. But if it's associated with the movement of um, the early childhood uh, folks and some of the head folks, uh, Head Start uh, children out of the Gary Melchers too, it certainly will. Okay. If it's part of that. But um, I, I need to find out a little bit more about that. Okay. And one thing we know, Miss Massey is always. <clears throat> asking the government to fund everything, including buses for her programs that she Absolutely. puts in those grants for. And yep. she, does she does an amazing job of uh, acquiring funding. Uh, she even got a roof paid for, a roof yeah, repair the, down at the Melchers yeah, Complex. She wouldn't know so. about the award until September, I think, or later on. Okay. Thank you. But I'll coordinate with yeah. her. Yes, ma'am. All right. That'll be coming back to us for action at the next meeting. Uh, the next item, 9.04, approval of purchase of 500 Chromebooks from Atronica Computers, Inc. for teachers attending the 2019 Teaching and Learning Summit at a cost not to exceed 125000 using budgeted FY19 operating funds. Any questions? Yeah, about I have a question. Um, yes, Ms. Young. So I think this we've done this three years in a row, right? And um, I just wanted to know if they're actually using the computers today, and if they're not, are we recycling them to perhaps maybe, if it's the same computers that we use in the, in the classrooms, 
would we be able to use them for those schools that don't have any? Because if the computer's just collecting dust somewhere, they're not So these used. computers are uh, used regularly by the teachers that have been assigned them. Um, we are able to track usage, and uh, we've identified that there's fairly regular usage of all of these devices. Okay. Um, and this is, <coughs> excuse me, this will be year three. So we've done this two years uh, prior, and this will be year three, which is the, um, the third cohort going through the summit. Mm -hmm. So you, you have data that says that yes, all of them are being used the past two years? I can't guarantee that every single one of them okay, are being but used, but I can say saying. that there is uh, usage of all of these devices, yes. Yeah, but if they're, um, and are they putting them on our network? Well, these are, these are devices okay. provisioned by okay. us so for the teachers. you should be able to tell, right? Yes, that, absolutely. Okay. So perhaps you could look and see if there's some that are not being used because this is the third year, and so total, we've, we've the total we, would be what? We provisioned about 1,500. 1,500. Well, this will be so 1,500. I would like just to know if there are actually Certainly. some that are not being used, right? Um, and am I correct that these are, we've moved away from having desktops to these being the computers that teachers use instead of desktop computers? So we currently have desktop computers in all of our classrooms. These are supplementary devices uh, because uh, prior to my arrival, the decision was made to um, refurbish and extend the life of those desktops, which was actually a fairly significant savings uh, over replacing them with uh, Windows laptops. Yeah. So these are supplementary devices, which gives the teachers a device that's the same device that the students are frequently using so that they've got a common experience. Uh, but it also allows them to access uh, our uh, web-based services like our student information system uh, when they are away from campus as well. So um, it's a, a utility device that they're using both in the classroom for instruction as well as for uh, administrative and planning uh, uses outside of normal instruction time. Okay. I have a quick question too. Um, yes, the Chromebooks, I know that some of our um, guidance offices um, aren't very well equipped yet with stations for kids to go in and like especially when they're going to choose their, their next year schedule and things mm -hmm. like that it gives it would give them an opportunity to kind of go in and hands-on and kind of do it on their own while they've got a guidance counselor you know kind of nearby to help mm -hmm. them navigate through it um just off the top of your head um what do you think it would cost and is it possible to make sure we have at least maybe two chromebooks in every guidance office um at the high school level absolutely we can do that um the Chromebooks are approximately $250 each. Okay. So, um, you know, two per guidance office would be $500. Uh, but um, we can certainly include that. We're currently developing kind of an overarching plan for uh, the baseline of technology that we think should be provisioned at the district level. Okay. Um, and we can certainly include that as uh, part of that plan to okay. make sure that we've got the, the right amount of technology support in the schools. Now, I will say that... Um, the individual principals have a great deal of latitude, obviously, in how they provision devices within their building. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, if, if that's something that they wanted to do, they could do that now. Right. I just, I feel like if we said to the principals, here are a couple extra for guidance, that's sure. exactly where they would go. Because, that, you know, like you said, they have the authority to redirect them elsewhere mm -hmm. where the need is. I think if we, if they're that inexpensive, that that's something that we might want to have a, you know, further conversation about going forward. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Egan. Any other comments? I, I, I'm just going to say real quick, uh, so this is the third phase, 500, mm -hmm. the last 500 for 1,500. So just, I would just ask, you know, and you're doing your communications plan now, your technology plan, mm -hmm. and hopefully that will get done. And just Dr. Kisner, I'd ask, just take a good look at it, make sure. I don't want to come back for Chromebook 2,000, you know. I don't want to come back with 2,000 Chromebooks in another eight months and then find out that, you know, after you do your plan, we only need, we don't, we don't need them. Sure. So, right. Yeah. So let me just, I know this is good because we're going to get to the question, I know, but is it, this generates other questions. Um, first of all, for those who don't know, this is Mr. Peter Taylor. This might be your first. It's my first yeah, time welcome. speaking. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Oh, sorry, um, for, sorry for being so not nice. No, no, no. no, he, <laughs> no he's our executive director of technology. So he's going to be coming to the FAB meeting in a, in a couple of weeks to begin to talk about the, bud, the technology vision and then uh, start talking about, and I met with him today, I've been meeting with him, and he, he has started 
and remarkably impressed. He, I think he's, he's going to bring us to places that we should be at, okay? Um, so I don't know when it will be, but it'll definitely be before the, the school year is over. He will present to you the uh, vision and the actual implementation of a strategic technology plan to improve student learning and improve um, our organizational efficiency. So students who do go to the school counselor's office to um, register do not have to like wait because I don't have a computer or, and I'll just mention one last thing. We are learning, and I, this is not pointing fingers, we are, uh, we have a great need to warehouse our data in a way that we could bring out the data to answer a lot of the questions that we have. It's, um, uh, it's been somewhat surprising, I'll just put it that way, and both of us coming from different school systems. The challenge it is sometimes to get data that we have sitting somewhere and spit it out in a way that could be, a, uh, to help us inform our decisions. So we are looking at data dashboards, you've heard me speak about that, and he's helping to restructure that whole process. So it's, I just want, don't want, uh, and I know you're not thinking this, it's a lot more than just the hardware that our conversations is gonna be talking about when it comes to technology. Okay. One, one more question, so I've, uh, we are, we're on the technology advisory committee together, so I've seen a preview of the plan, but I just wanted to um, ask you one more question in terms of the training. So after they leave the summit, and maybe you don't have that answer, but after they leave the summit, do these teachers or teachers in general get additional training, not just on site because they can't work the computer, but are they getting additional training for whatever reason using these computers? Um, if I, I'll invite Jay and Strike up to um, speak to this as well, but I'll also, but I will preface any of her comments by saying, um, while the Chromebooks are being provisioned to support the training that they're doing in the, the summit. Uh, the ITRTs that are uh, uh, staffed at every school uh, provide a great deal of supplementary ongoing training, not only how to use the device, because in a lot of ways we're past that. It's really how to use the di device for instruction, how to make um, the device an effective instructional tool. Uh, so um, I don't know if you want to add. Uh, let, me just say, let, me just say, <laughs> let me just say one thing. He's kind of touched upon it. And I say this respectfully, and, and hopefully it doesn't come across sarcastic, which I have been accused of doing. Say. So yesterday, you might have noticed I got a haircut. I'm, it looks very good. Thank you. So, um, yeah. so while I'm waiting at the haircuttery, I'm sitting next to a little five-year-old that I'm just hoping will not uh, act like a five-year-old. And the entire time, this little kid was on a Chromebook. We are not giving out the most advanced, complicated pieces of technology. Every teacher that we employ have gone through a class in their graduate or undergraduate on instructional technology. They, trust me when I say this, they know how to use this Chromebook. They know how to use it to a level of um, helping to improve instruction at a relatively primitive level. This is why it's $250, okay? Let's, let's not kid ourselves. What we are doing is we're offering a convenience. So they have the computers that are on their desk. They could travel with this home, work on lesson plans, communicate with parents, um, look at you know student information, and, and, and look at grades. So I, I guess I guess what I say I want to give our staff uh, uh, you know uh, give you a better understanding of what our staff already are able to do. And the training that we're talking about is not specific to the Chromebook. It's specific to how you integrate technology to support the instruction, regardless of what you have in front of you, okay? So I, I just bring it up because, um, you know, if, if you're gonna stand there and say, yeah, we're gonna do hours of technology, hours of staff development for these $250 Chromebooks, we would be misleading you. We would, yeah. And yeah, I'm, not say, I'm not saying you're saying that. What I'm just saying is that we give it, and actually a question that was asked at the last meeting, which I don't think is a bad question. I think it's a good question. The question is, do we want to do it? We're not seeking an answer. This is our, what will we do? Do we want to offer this for the staff that don't have the Chromebooks? That was my question. Yeah, that was your question, right? So I'm giving you the credit. So about a quarter of our I said I want to offer it, not do we offer it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so about 25% of our teachers approximately, if would not have this 
um, uh, benefit. And, um, you know, so that's just another question we could ask at so, another time formally. So my, my comment is more in terms of let's not just use it for entering grades and everything, but perhaps try to use it for more since it's only 250, but the more the teachers use it, yeah. uh, the more they may want to use it for other things. And since it's there, why not use it? Because what I'm thinking is that after that summit, depending on who the teacher is, they may just put it down and there it goes and only use it for certain things. And you could use it for much more than that. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and again, the, uh, the um, training is not how to use the device. It's, Correct. it's really how to use the device for instruction. For instruction. And all of the teachers who have the devices are supported by the building ITRT going forward. Good. Good to know. Thank you. Thank you for okay, that. Okay. If anybody thinks of any more questions or wants some more information before this comes back for action, this doesn't need to get today, right? Um, looking at dating um, some of you, Dr. Fisher, and we'll pass them along. Welcome to uh, Thank you. All right, that brings us to the last information item, certainly not the least, um, 9.05, selection of an elementary school redistricting plan to become effective in the 2019-2020 school year. This item is on the agenda because we, um, under our policies, have an item come to us for, oh, sorry. This item is on our agenda because we have items come to us for information before they come for action. It will be coming to us for action at the March 26th um, meeting. Dr. Kisner has uh, given us notice, um, advance notice, that he needs a decision on that date if he's going to be able to get all the um, integral parts working for the school year that starts on August 12th. Is it August 12th we starting? Okay, so, so that will be coming back. Um, I don't know if there's any desire to have any discussion on that tonight. We certainly will be hearing on the, um, from the community at the public hearings, and then we'll be having a work session next week as well. Unless there's anyone that wants to speak to this this evening. I would like to say one thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, welcome. Is, with, with both of these plans, I, I still do have serious concerns about Moncure opening at over 90 percent. Um, and, and I know there may be, there, there, I, I, my hope is that with both of these plans, there can be some kind of um, proposed shift so that we can lower that, because that just seems, um, th that seems problematic to me. But that's, that's just me and my comment. Yes, Ms. I'll, Decatur, I'll that, just, that was the intro. Yeah, thank you. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just follow up to that. Um, as you guys are aware, I didn't get a chance to make my request at the board meeting. And since these um, plans were voted on to be sent to um, the public hearings, there wasn't an opportunity following the vote to request any more shifts. So um, I do have a request that I'll be making at our next work session, um, hopefully. So, um, so yeah, and that, that should be really helpful for that. I, I do as well. Uh, I, I was traveling on business. Um, on the, I was on the West Coast, and I was in a, as you know, I was not at the last work session, but I did try to get on, on in the airport and sent an email, and it didn't, didn't work out real well. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's primarily with E21. E um, um, plan C was the plan that some board members, including myself, uh, kind of was hoping that would go, and, and, it, and it didn't, and it, and it is what it is. However, um, for the Ferry Farm District, I've asked for no changes uh, because I thought it, that, the, that the Arc Bridge consultant did a pretty good job. On Plan E, though, there, and that was for Plan C, but on Plan E, though, there was two small changes, and it was the Kendallwood Estates and the, Brook, and the Brookfield Hills. Um, the district is is north south boundary is white oak road and these are the two, the, the only two um small you know 135 kids and one has 20 kids it's the only two uh neighborhoods on on, on the north side of brookville road unless i'm set mistaken um that are kind of went to grafton and now they're going to conway and ferry farm and and if you remember uh, when Miss Egan brought up the points and her constituents brought up the points of uh, Marlboro Point 
and um, you know Courthouse Road, and and their love of Stafford Elementary School, and uh, and how you know that was not a problem, and they were intended to go down to Grafton, and it was a and it was a drive, and I, and I had no issues with that, and and so that actually primarily that that went forward, and made some room, and made some room at Grafton um, because now they're going to Stafford. Um, elementary school and and that's and that's okay when the kids stay at their schools with me and, and so I, I guess um, uh, on the next board meeting I'm hoping to um, talk about those two neighborhoods um, and, um, and 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 let allow those children to stay at Grafton Elementary School which is you know I have the percentages it's a low percentage school Grafton is somewhere around 78 percent where Conway is up in the 90s and 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 and, and uh, Ferry Farm is around 80 87 and then it'll be going through construction over the next few years. Right. And so I, I just wanted to let you know that and I, did not, I didn't have the opportunity to call in um, and, and um, I, I am okay with my um, Western uh, boundary, but those, those boundaries are, are, are really contiguous, kind of outside my, what I call contiguous to the, to the natural boundaries of, of, the, of the school and they also meet the intent of, of just leaving the kids um, at Grafton. So. I Thank just you, wanted Mr. to say Matt that. Oscar. Okay. And I, I know we've gotten some um, some emails as, as well on that. So people that are not able to come to the public hearing, if they will email us, that will be taken into consideration as well. And I'll, I, I'm going to get you, um, well, you go ahead, and I'll, I'll wrap it up. <laughs> sure. Um, for the record, um, yes, there was a plan, actually a plan D that was great, um, you know, kept uh, Embry Mill in Winding Creek that got voted down. I was the only one that voted for that. And C was a good plan for the South and for some of us in the North, but um, we didn't have to vote for that either. Um, so the plans that are left, um, the one that I'm working with is the E21 specifically. Um, and this weekend I spend um, time, or last weekend actually, I worked with um, school board member Egan on Brook Road. Uh, we talked about that and um, we worked together on Winding Creek making sure that is not full capacity and I would like to work with um, school board member Decatur. I have some ideas for you to um, bring relief to Moncure. So we could talk about that. Um, so I visited you know, Woodstream, Fox Village, Arbor Grove Apartments, Spring Hill Town Homes, talked to several parents. I ran into several teachers, tried to recruit them back to Stafford. I spoke praise about our superintendent <laughs> and um, hoping, you know, they'll come back. But um, the Woodstream community is, is pretty close-knit. They have Facebook. I know you said you drove through there or you spoke to them, but they have uh, Facebook. And as far as they were concerned, um, they thought that's where they were going to stay, so they didn't try to get involved anymore because they thought they were going to stay at Moncure. Um, so when they saw the plan, um, they probably will show up tomorrow at the hearing. But um, like I said, there I have some ideas for Mr. Cater um, and for the board, so I will bring those up um, at the next board meeting for some changes to bring relief to Moncure and Barrett. Any other, Mr. Cater? You know what, I'll just yeah. clarify. I, um, I'm wondering if the changes, are Are you proposing to move my constituents around? Nope. Okay. Okay, that's good, because I know we all said we were going to stay within our districts. Yeah. We're staying within our district. Yep. Okay, any other comments? Um, I'd like to say that the time that we will be getting down to uh, details on this will be the work session, which it will be a week from uh, Thursday on March 21st, when we will have had the benefit of the two public hearings and also, you know, all the email correspondence, which fortunately we, we, we have that ability to share. And thank you, Ms. Hall. I know it's a lot of extra work for you for reading those emails, but I think we all appreciate it because that way we get to see the comments from everyone, not just the ones that are, you know, directed to, um, to us personally. Um, so, so that uh, we will be prepared at that work session to roll up sleeves and 
you know, have some, some discussion um, as long as it takes to, to get through there. And then the vote will be two weeks from tonight on the um, is there 26th any, is of there March. Any, is there any truth to the, um, the new center being called the Healy Center? The, the what? The North Star instead of, is it Healy now? Did I saw huh? an email on the Healy Center? No? <laughs> we didn't vote on that. I, I think if my name is used, it may be in another context. <laughs> um, no, I just want to make sure we get that name right. Ms. Egan made sure we got that early you know, education, education center, center and, and it wasn't in, in the other one. All right, well, if you'll indulge me, I have this, uh, this long list of meetings. I'll try to read them fast. The next uh, regular meeting of the school board is March 26th at 7 p.m. On March 13th, we have the redistricting uh, public hearing at North Stafford High School, 6.30. Uh, 6.30 on the 14th is the redistricting public hearing number two at Stafford High School. On the 18th is the backup date for public hearing. I don't think we're anticipating any inclement weather this week, so hopefully we won't need that. Um, the Finance and Budget Committee is, is going to be uh, rescheduled to April 4th, second, uh, April second. 2nd. Um, the school board presentation of its FY20 funding request to the Board of Supervisors is uh, next Tuesday, March 19th at 4.30, and that's going to be at the County Government Center. We're going to make our presentation, and then immediately following that, we will have a work session with the Board of Supervisors, 7-on-7, uh, seven seven to discuss the budget. Um, also, um, oh, they, they have that down at 5 o'clock, so... The 21st is our redistricting work session, which is going to be in the Professional Development Center. And the school board meeting next is the 26th of March. So you're all welcome to come to any or all of those meetings. Thank you very much. Uh, we are adjourned.